Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving. Welcome to Denver United. Thanks for coming to worship God with us this holiday week. I think Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday until Christmas. Then I said that's my favorite holiday. I just love them both. But I love Thanksgiving because it's the one that like consumer culture can't get its hands on and it can't get its mind around. So it just sort of flies over the top because there's not much to sell. You can only sell so many like turkey kits. And, and so it just kind of skips from Halloween to Christmas. And I think it's our holiday, right? We are the people of gratitude as the people of God. I was thinking this morning about Philippians 1, and I was just praying before the service for you all. It says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And uh, man, I just read that, I, I feel God's heart. I'm so thankful for, you, for all of you, for being able to be family, for racing Jesus and seeking and following after him or searching for him, wherever you are in that journey, doing it together in a post-Christian city and in a post-Christian age in our country, being the standard bearers for Jesus. Man, love you all so much and so thankful for you. And it occurs to me that no matter what's going on in our lives, we have something to be thankful for as God's people. And it's easy and right for us to focus on the things that are hard. Some of us are in a time of grief or lament. Some of us are in a time of longing and maybe deep, unfulfilled longing that's turned uh, to bitterness of heart. Some of us are in a time of job transition or in the time of friend transition or trying to buy a house and the interest rates are stupid or trying to sell a house and the interest rates are stupid or whatever. Wherever we find ourselves, those things are real. And it can be easy in Christian culture to sort of fly over the top and say, uh, how are you? I'm blessed, you know, and diminish the hardness of life. It can also be easy, though, to see the hardness of life and forget that, friends, we are blessed and we have so much to be thankful for. So it's Thanksgiving week. I just want to know, what are you thankful for? Like, not rhetorically. Just shout something out. Like... All right, we got to say them. We got to say them loud enough that everyone can hear, though. Family. Family. What is it? Thankful for being here and alive. Alive? Heck yeah. What else? Community. Friends. Friends. I'm thankful for that. What are you thankful for? Sobriety. Come on. Anyone else thankful for that? I talked to someone last week who is six years sober, and then I talked to someone else who was 24 years sober, and I thought, thank God for that. Easy and makes sense to be walking in the hardship of addiction, hard to stand up to that thing and say no, no more. Man, thankful for that. Can we give God thanks for that? That's incredible. For all of you who are walking that journey, proud of you. What else are you thankful for? Come on. Did you guys hear that? Like she said, I'm thankful for the men in my life that help take care of me because I'm single. And there's a lot of times that people aren't thankful for men because men have exploited or harmed or hurt or did something wrong. And, you know, it's true. But that's pretty awesome that men have shown up. Thank God for that. Who else is thankful for something? What? Health. Health. Man, me too. You know those little windows in life where you wake up and realize everyone's okay, everyone's healthy. Maybe that's not you. You're like, I want that blessing next year. Jeremy said he'll stick around and, and lay hands on you. Healing session after church. But thank God for that. What else? Man, I'm thankful for your son's sobriety too. Thank you, Jesus. Freedom in Christ, no doubt. And freedom in, in society that we can gather and worship without fear of reprisal or being thrown into jail. Pretty awesome. What are you thankful for? Life. Oh, your wife? Man, no kidding. <laughs> Anyone else thankful for your spouse or your partner? Met a couple that's engaged this morning. Where are you all at? Sorry, I'm totally calling you out without your permission, but now I'm into it. Oh, I know they're engaged. Thankful for that. Where are you guys that I just spoke to this morning? They're engaged. Oh, there you are. Come on. Thankful for that. I'll tell you what. In an age where there aren't a lot of people serving Jesus, finding someone, just meeting someone, it's a major blessing. Anyone else thankful for something? How about three more things? I'm thankful for you. Oh, I'm thankful for you too, Nadine. 
You guys are the best. Man, thankful for all of you who were together for our community dinner, Thanksgiving edition in Lincoln Park yesterday. I think that what we said together, well, Rose and I said it, then I said it to the group that was there. I'll say it to you too. When Jesus said, love your neighbor, I think what he meant was love your neighbor. Don't overthink it. Just do it. And that was pretty awesome that we did it and you all did it. What else? Two more things you thankful for. Man, the baptisms last week, incredible. Celebrating with Ozzy, with Charlie, with so many of you guys. How about you, Bill? Yeah? You quit? Bill quit smoking. Come on. Thank God. I'll tell you what. What are you, like 39, Bill? You got that, like, anti-aging potion going. However you are, get to your age and quit smoking. Come on. He's good at that. Who's 73? You're 73? Okay. Uh, one more thing to be straight. <laughs> That's amazing that you're 73. Man, I want your lotion or <laughs> whatever, you, whatever you got going. <laughs> one, uh, Miss Mina is 72 today. Is that right? Did I hear that correctly? 72 today? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so you don't want us to know, but that's amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. Did I get your name wrong? It's, it's Kina, right? Kina, yeah. Happy birthday, Kina. Can we all say birthday, Miss Kina? <laughs> Happy birthday. Thankful for you. Man, you guys have spent a long time serving the Lord and passing that faith to your family, and I want to be like you. Congratulations. Hey, love you all. Thankful for you guys. You ready to study the word? All right, let's do it. Anders Timesard, he's like, that whole thankfulness segment, didn't plan for that. Where's that going to come from in the budget? I, there's always time. Thank you. I needed to sort of get blessed by my father confessor of the schedule. All right. All right. Stop laughing. Time to get to the word. Father, thanks for this family of believers. Thanks for your work, your mercies that are new every morning. Thank you that it says that... W- We can be confident of this, that he who began this good work in us is faithful to bring it to completion. What that means is for everything that we said we're thankful for, there's something else that we're longing for or grieving over or hurting because of. And Lord, we trust you even as we thank you that you've begun this good work in us and you are capable of completing it. And so we just hold one another's grief, pain, longing, disappointment, hardship, uh, sickness, and we just say, Lord, have mercy, and would you finish the good work that you started. And Jesus, let your kingdom come in our lives. We now focus our attention on your word, and this is our worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to tell you the story this morning of two women, unlikely heroes both, faithful to the point of a legacy that they neither sought nor saw coming. Rosa Louise McCauley, perhaps you haven't heard of her. She was born in Tuskegee, Alabama on February 4th, 1913. Her mother was a teacher. Her family valued education. She attended high school but left at 16, early in the 11th grade, in order to care for her dying grandmother. And shortly thereafter, her chronically ill mother. In 1932, she married her husband, Raymond. He was a self-educated man who worked as a barber. He supported his wife in her efforts to earn her high school diploma, which she ultimately did the following year. Rosa Luis worked as a seamstress for the next 22 years. You might never have heard of her. Shakespeare famously observed, some are born great, some achieve greatness, And some have greatness thrust upon him, them. Such are the stories of these two women, born at the wrong time. Two women who have been swept away in the tide of the injustice of their day. Two women who recognized that through a life of obscurity and of hardship, of a small story of hopes, successes, dreams, and failures, There comes a time still, a time to stand. 
That's our title this morning. The question is, we're in this series, What Was I Made For?, culminates, I think, in how will I be remembered? The logical conclusion of the question that begins, what was I made for, concludes with, what will my life have meant? What will it mean to have been me? What imprint might I leave on my community, on this planet? What did it mean to be me? The scripture teaches of another young woman you might never have heard of. Her name was Hadassah. And she was born into captivity as the people of Israel were conquered and hauled away the remnant who weren't killed into slavery in the Babylonian Empire. She spent her whole life in captivity or in an era where her people were subjected to the, at times, brutal and certainly capricious overlordship of one empire and then the next. During her time, the Babylonian empire gave way to the Persian empire. The Persians came in and decided they were going to be kinder, gentler overlords, but they still held the people of Israel against their will. And so it was in the reign of the Persian king Xerxes that young Hadassah came of age. The story goes that Xerxes, and I'll fill this in for the sake of time, you can read it in the book of Esther, chapter 1, but the king was Xerxes, and he was um, drunk with power. So he had a queen who was beautiful and everything you'd expect, and, and one day he was drunken at a party, and he wanted to show his power and dominance, and so he like sent for his wife like a person would call their dog, and she's like excuse me, and kind of had a little Queen Latifah action, and she's like, I'm not coming when you call. And so she didn't come, and so he deposed her from being queen and sent her away because he's like a psychopath like that. And then he woke up in Esther chapter 2, his bed was empty, and he's like, I need a queen. And so he did what any self-respecting psychopath monarch does. He had like a, a, a bachelorette caliber objectify women competition. Totally gross, not endorsing it. The scripture's not endorsing it. It's merely reporting that it happened. All right? So verse 2 of Esther chapter 2. This is our this morning. Would you stand with me for the reading of the word of God? The king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king, gross, not endorsing it. Scripture's not endorsing it. Just reporting that, in fact, it happened. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young, women, the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman who was also known as Esther had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So Esther, as probably a teenager, had her name changed and her face changed and was subjected to this vaudeville reality show. She was objectified, exploited, and trafficked. And ultimately, she was crowned as royalty. That is a complicated backstory to say the least. It might have seemed that she made good. God stayed faithful to her as she stayed faithful to him, and 
that being queen, becoming ruler of a land or at least token co-ruler where her people were subjected to captivity, that perhaps this was Esther's purpose, that this was what she was made for. I want to suggest that her story yields a different and important lesson, though. Our purpose is more than the influence we accumulate. It's how we choose to use it. And that's the big idea this morning. Our purpose is more than the influence we amass. It's what we choose to do with it that matters. It's easy to, uh, to confuse accomplishment with purpose, aggrandizement with true greatness. Becoming queen was significant, no doubt, in Esther's. I would suggest the scripture goes on to teach that it was merely the context for the purpose of Esther's life. We find out that her uncle Haman, or rather her uncle Mordecai, who was the one that raised Hadassah, turned Esther, was, as the story progresses, kind of beefing with Haman, who was the king's also psychopathic right-hand man. I think one of the side lessons is that psychopath um, despotic dictators tend to have psychopath despotic number twos, right? So that's Haman. Um, for the sake of brevity. And he has, is jealous of Mordecai, who's like a successful but righteous and upstanding dude. And so he has this like vendetta that he's trying to take out on him. But because he's psychopath and despotic, he decides that merely getting back at Mordecai isn't enough. Genocide is obviously the answer. And so he decides he wants to take out, convince the king to literally obliterate all of the Jewish people. Classic, like, Jewish people plight. They're always at the verge of getting obliterated. Horrible storyline continued one more time. So we're going to look at chapter 3 now for the sake of time. Look with me in verse 8. Haman said to Xerxes, these are the two that are, uh, Haman's the, the number two who's beefing with Esther's uncle Mordecai. He goes to the king and says, there's this certain people that are dispersed among the peoples in your provinces of your kingdom, but they keep themselves separate. They don't do the stuff you're telling them to do. They're not assimilating. They're not good Persians. Their customs are, for all the other people, they don't obey your laws. It's not in your best interest to tolerate them. So if it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. And so they have a conversation about this, and ultimately dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on one single day. So psychopathic king issues a genocide order because his, the people as the people of God always have when they follow God, we're set apart, not breaking the law, just not doing the psychopathic king's bidding, and so he orders them to be exterminated. A dark day for the people of Israel. They came to the brink of annihilation during young Hadassah's time. So she being at least in token power, and we saw how much that got her predecessor, but at least in a position where she might be able to influence something, Mordecai slips word to her in the palace of this genocide order and asks her to intervene. Well, Esther responds consternated because who wouldn't be? She saw what happened to her predecessor queen just by not coming when called. And she's like, I'm no hero, Uncle Mordecai. And do you even understand the risks involved if I speak up? Probably just going to get brutally killed. But genocide? We each have to decide whether we're going to turn a blind eye to the darkness of our time. No matter whether the darkness is impending genocide or the slow trickle and death of morality and goodness in our society. We all must choose whether we turn a blind eye to the darkness of our day. In the American South, in the 1950s, 
the Jim Crow segregation laws meant that life was fraught with daily challenges for black Americans, only allowed to attend certain and inferior schools, to drink from specified water fountains, to borrow books from the black library, among a myriad of other dis- restrictions, unjust to all, to say the least. Black citizens found the back of the bus law particularly incendiary and demeaning. But most had to ride the bus because they had no other way to get to work. So most begrudgingly went along. And so it was for young Rosa Louise McCauley, day after day, faced with the pervading injustice of her time, forced to contemplate whether to keep the peace, to keep her job, to keep her family safe, to keep going with it. Friends, our God is a God of justice. To serve God asks of us, look up, recognize the injustice, recognize the brokenness and the darkness of our own day. Because the great injustices of our time are your injustices. The great conflicts of our day are your conflicts. Whether they seem directly to affect you or not. Did you know that there are more human slaves alive right now than at any one point previously in all of human history? And we live in the abolition era. Did you know that women, men, and children are trafficked? Yes, on the other side of the world, but right here in Denver as we speak. Did you know that almost certainly a tractor trailer truck that you've sat next to in traffic was full of humans? Did you know children are exploited for sex, for labor, They're sold for standing in society or simply to put bread on the table all around the world today. That humans face discrimination, containment, and subjugation because of their racial identity all around the world. that people are born, live out the entirety of their lives, and die under the scourge of poverty, never knowing that there is another way. Tender one, that nearly 70 million Americans have been killed before having the opportunity to make a single choice for themselves. That whole nations of humans are so egregiously repressed by their own government that they are imprisoned, even tortured, if they're found with just a page of Holy Scripture. That people suffer financial indignity and hardship and often unovercomable opposition purely for trying to do the good of adopting a child who's vulnerable, exploited, and hopeless.
We live in the age of progress, and yet there is darkness everywhere. These injustices are your injustices. What a loss to sit quietly in the face of injustice and just hope that it will pass. Perhaps the most damning thing MLK said was the ultimate tragedy. It's not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And I just named a few of them. There are so many more. Back to... The Persian Empire, Esther, understandably, equivocated. She hemhawed for a bit. She saw how things went when you opposed that mad king. Chapter 4 and verse 12, her words were sent back to Mordecai. Her words of equivocation. And he answered, don't think that because you're in the king's house... You alone of all the Jews will escape. Our plight is your plight. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews, listen, make no mistake, will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go. Gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. A purpose-driven life, a pursuit of the question in earnest, what was I made for, ultimately has to ask the uncomfortable question, is my power such as it is, is it for me or is it for something bigger? Esther spoke up and got involved in the injustice of her people. It's a tremendous personal risk. Is my power for me, or is it for something bigger? Mari and I traveled to New York this fall, kind of an empty nest therapy trip, because like we thought, what, what can we do that you can't do in mid-October when your kids are in school? Go to New York and look at leaves in Central Park in the middle of the week and go to a jazz club and eat at an overpriced restaurant. You can eat at an overpriced restaurant at any time in New York, or Denver for that matter. But the rest, very distinct to this season. So we decided to go, and um, we went to see a, a Broadway show. We saw Hell's Kitchen, which is the young, like the backstory of Alicia Keys, because my wife's a big fan, and I didn't know much about Alicia Keys, but I love her, her music. And so the story was captivating, and the young lady that played her was just devastatingly good. If you're in New York, see the show. It's that good. Um, and it turns out that... The, at the end, the, the cast member who plays her mom came out and she's like, hey, we have something special for you tonight. Alicia Keys founded a charity and so we thought, oh, kind of hate that I thought this, but I was like, oh man, we're going to get the captive audience like timeshare sales pitch for Alicia Keys' charity. And she's like, no, we're not asking you for money. It's that she set a, a, a milestone kind of goal a while back and basically we hit it that night in ticket sales. And she's like, so we have a guest who's going to talk to you about that. Alicia Keys. We're like, oh, what? And so she literally walks out. We did the ticket kiosk same day. I waited like an hour and a half in, uh, in line at that thing to get the tickets. And it turns out we were on the second row. And so I was like, meet a Nadine to Alicia Keys. Total fanboy moment. I'm like, oh, I was like fanning myself. <laughs> girl, girl, you know, and that. And so I thought she's going to come out and either like sing. But she, you know what she did? She came in, is that picture up there? That was like literally this dude and then us. Super cool. Anyway, um, and she just said, I just want to say thank you. And she spent probably 10 minutes, and you know what she talked about? 
not her fame, not her songs, not even the show that's about her life. She talked about how, like, 15 years ago or something, she did a show in Africa, and she was confronted with uh, the, the um, crisis of orphans, of children without home and family, and then asked, what's going to happen to these kids? And, you know, somebody told her basically what their path in life would likely look like, and um, it ended up with being like a child soldier or a prostitute usually, and she was like, I can't unhear that. And so she started a, a foundation to advocate for those kids the, in that one place where she went, thinking, I can try and care about the whole world and sing songs and dedicate them to impoverished children, or I can raise money for those kids. And so a, a portion of every ticket from every show and, and her musicals, I guess, too, from that point on went to this. And then she said, when we reach this much, I'll triple it from my own money, and we're going to... And it happened that night. And I thought, there's a million good singers. Alicia Keys is undoubtedly one of them. But that, that is awesome. Is my power for me or is it for something bigger? Now, not all of us are going to be like multi-platinum selling, you know, superstars and have that kind of talent. But all of us have power. We have discretion. We all have a choice implicitly when we wake up in the morning with what we're going to do with it. And there is this fallacy when we think about purpose, the fallacy, call it, of, of conservation, that to amass influence is to achieve purpose. Influence is cachet. It's in the leveraging of it. It's finding something that I just cannot stay seated about and standing up and spending that reserve that I've been amassing. It's saying, maybe I went looking for it. Maybe I was just there to do a concert and I was riding in my, in my like Escalade and I saw these kids out of the side of the car, but I can't unsee that and I can't get okay with it. And so that cause, that's my cause because I live on planet earth. So I'm going to stand up and do something about it. What a sad life that spent amassing influence in order to hold on to it. It's the fallacy of conservation. The tendency is not to stand up for something we know is wrong because it might cost us. We might lose the platform of influence that we have if we stand up for something. The scripture says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We talked about that two weeks ago in the context of standing up against a generational heritage of brokenness and saying, no, this stops here. It is for my freedom and my descendants, but it is for their freedom too. It's for freedom in the fullest, most expansive context that Christ has set you and me free, to be agents, proponents, ambassadors of freedom. We are reconciled in Christ in order to become ministers of reconciliation. I love this. Did you know how we're saved? Ephesians 2.8, kind of the watchwords of us evangelical Christians, we're saved by grace through faith. It means we didn't deserve it and we can't earn it. Jesus Christ died on a cross so that you and I can be forgiven, can be restored, made new, and live a new life. It is by grace through faith we've been saved. Don't let anyone tell you anything different, and if they try to tell you that's the way it is, walk out of that church. Did you know it doesn't stop there, though? Verse 10 continues, for. In other words, that's true, right? You're saved by grace through faith on account of the fact that or in preparation for the notion that you are Christ's workmanship, created for good works in him, prepared in advance for you to do. The salvation isn't the end. It's the beginning. It's not the purpose. It's the mean purpose. It's the context. You're Christ bearers. And we are called to bring Christ to bear on a weary and broken world. That's a good place to say amen. I learned a lot of practical life wisdom from my dad. He wasn't much of a theologian. In, in terms of his faith, he was a simple man, a deep thinker, a man of principle and conviction. But when he heard something to be right... He was kind of like Aaron Marsden. He just discovered, this is right. This is what I'm going to do. It's like what we were talking about in fall group. I was, I was like choked up after that conversation because you remind me. So I was like, who does he remind me of? And I realized it's my dad. He, 
I'm not saying you're a simple man in, in general. You're a complex, wonderful man. But you just have a simple understanding of faith. Like, this is, this is what is true. I've come to believe it. And so this is how I'm going to live my life. My dad was like that. So he didn't dissect theology. He didn't need to unravel things. He never deconstructed his faith if he didn't understand something. He just went back to what he knew was true. And my dad taught me to live a life in which you stand for something. When the time comes to take a stand, he used to say, stand with courage and humility and conviction. Because who knows whether you were put here for such a time as this. It was December 1st. 1955, now 42-year-old Rosa McCauley Parks had spent more than two decades commuting to and from work in the back of that Montgomery bus. It was a Thursday. She was riding home after a long day of work at the Montgomery Fair department store. Segregation was written into law. The front of a Montgomery bus was reserved, a historian has noted, for white citizens and the seats behind them for black citizens. Nonetheless, at one point on the route, a white man had no seat because all the seats in the designated white section were taken. So the driver told the riders in the four seats of the first row of the colored section to stand in effect, adding another row to the white section. The three others obeyed. Rosa Parks did not. Two police officers approached the stopped bus and placed Parks in custody. From her biography written many years later, people always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired. But that isn't really true, she wrote. I wasn't tired, not physically. No, the only tired I was was tired of going along and giving in. What was I made for? It's the question we've been asking this month. I think it's true of every one of us that in the context of fulfilling the work, the righteous work that God's given us to do, living the life of relationships with which God has surrounded us, whether that is being single and creating community with roommates, and whether that's raising teenagers or having two incomes and no kids, jealous of you, wherever we find ourselves. Stewarding that righteous work, those good relationships, the opportunities, robust or meager, such as they are, which are placed in our path, making the most of them for sure, wisely amassing influence, for such a time as this. But I think there comes a day in each of our lives when to answer the question with integrity, what was I made for? We must find a thing we cannot stay seated about and stand up. What's that going to be? Sometimes the Lord comes to us like in a blinding light. Sometimes the circumstance happens to us because we go through something awful and a cause gets planted in us like that nobody else would have to experience the injustice which I have had to experience. Sometimes we're born into a cause which we didn't ask for and which we didn't deserve like Rosa Parks was, like Esther was before her. Sometimes life's going along fine. It doesn't ask us to rock the boat. Sometimes if that's us, 
we'll get a flash. We'll get a blinding light, revelation, an angelic visitation, a wedded fleece, something that says, this is God. Take up this cause. But most of the time, it doesn't happen that way. Most of the time, it's the Holy Spirit and his gentle witness in our hearts saying, lift up your eyes, look to the horizon, take in the world around you, understand its darkness, find something that touches your heart, that connects with your story, or which you simply can reach with the power entrusted to you and stop staying seated and stand. That's what it means to be alive. That's what it means to be sons and daughters of God. I think that's what it means to be us, to have power and to have purpose. That's why we do a legacy offering every year. Not to twist your arm, not to get more of your money, but to stimulate purpose. I mean, is your purpose in life to give to the legacy offering? Wait, what's that, Lord? It is? No, I'm just kidding. No, probably not, right? It's just practice. It's just reps. Because standing up in small ways makes standing up in the big way more natural. It creates muscle memory. It mows down opposition. Like, if I hem a haw to death about whether I should reallocate a thousand bucks from my savings account to buy beds for kids in India that are leaping on the floor after being found in a trash can, if I have to overthink that, there's something wrong with me. That's just me. So I'm not saying this is your purpose. It just creates an opportunity to practice. It creates a pathway for small wins. It makes it easier to get used to saying yes to God, to seeing an injustice an opportunity to leverage power and turn it into purpose. So that when we see it, when we hear it, when somebody says it, like Alicia Keys driving in her motorcade, easiest thing in the world to say, ain't that a shame, and then look to my next concert stop. But what a woman of substance that would say, I can't unsee that. So such as I have, I'm going to use the power given to me. I'm going to live on purpose. One of my heroes in our community is John Spencer, who's recently with Rena. Lots of you know John moved to the Pacific Northwest. John, when you listen to this, we love you, man. Rena, we love you. Um, and he was an engineer by trade, kind of a mild-mannered, everyday sort of guy, successful, built a small practice, you think did well, sold it. But um, as I recall the story, he years ago went with his church at the time on a, on a mission trip and saw in India this epidemic of teenage girls, of children who were trafficked into prostitution, many of whom, when he asked how did they get there, hadn't been kidnapped or something that gives you a bad guy to really hate, but had been sold by their parents. And he couldn't unsee that. So he came home and started New Horizon House, some others. He's like, I, we didn't really know what we were doing. And Today, they have the house full and they're building a second, rescuing young women, redeeming their lives, restoring their sanity and dignity, teaching them that they're lovable and that they're loved, training them with job skills, and then sending them into the world with community and hope. And that's a righteous work. And that's part of what we do. We support those girls every year. We're going to chip in to help build that next one out of our legacy fund in the coming year. Some of us are going to build a, a home for trafficked girls. Some of us are going to do something dramatic and singular because maybe we have the, we're hyper empowered in one way. We have the resources or we have the leadership, the entrepreneurial skill. Others of us 
are going to get involved and help out in some way. Maybe we man the, the hotline for Rescue Denver so that when people call in, there's someone loving on the other end of that line that can know what there is hope, and I'm going to help you. You can get out of this tonight. Or maybe we're going to get involved with addiction, like my friend Adam, and say, you know what? I'm going to help other people because I've seen enough people have their lives claimed by this horror. Maybe that's where we stand. I don't need to tell you where to stand. you got the Holy Spirit living in you. I can't even tell you to stand. I can just be a herald of the Word of God and stand up and as best I can illuminate it to you and ask you, like Jesus said when we began this month, in this question, will you have ears to hear? And then give you, like a good coach, uh, a practice course to go out there and practice, build those muscles, gain that confidence, build those skills. That's what the legacy offering is. It's an opportunity for us to begin the holiday season, the season of me and us, by saying, not me, not us, others. Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's like starting out the season that's all about frenetic receiving by giving. It's an offering. It's not, there's no pressure. This is separate from your regular giving, such that, let me just ask, don't take whatever it is you regularly give to God through Denver United and write legacy on there or check legacy on the, on the website. All that does is create a, a challenge for us by designated, designating undesignated funds because we need those. That's the ministry that we do. This is over and above your regular giving if you have the ability and the willingness. It's a free will offer. Some may have a lot to give. Give a lot. The scripture says if a person's gift is leadership, let them lead. If a person's gift is generosity, let them give. That's a spiritual gift that some have. And as you exercise that gift, God's going to bless you with more development of your gifts. Others don't have much to give. And we're living paycheck to paycheck. And it's like I could give up lattes for a month and send that. Great. And others will be like, you know what? Right now, I'm in the hole. I'm actually the one needing to be given to. Got it. And we're going to do that. We're helping with different ones of you in situations that you didn't ask for and you didn't deserve, but where you're up a creek. It's one of the ways that we leverage this goodness every year is helping out one another in a dignified way. So I simply want to invite you. Not very good at the money game. No pressure. No holding up your checkbooks. No bringing your money up here and putting it at the feet of Pastor Daniel. None of the nonsense. If you've been a part of churches in the past that have done money nonsense, let's just address that real quick. It sucks. I hate it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that happened. You're like, you didn't do it. I know, but I'm not saying I'm sorry as though I did it. I'm very well aware I didn't. But I'm sorry that it happened to you. I'm sorry. Like, I would be jaded too. I'd eye roll and get prickly or want to slip out early to, like, get a two-hour head start on the Broncos if I heard the pastor starting to talk about an offering too. I get it. I'm sorry that it's not right. It's not Jesus' heart. It's not the way it should be done. All I can do is say, man, Jesus heal that. And then let's try to do it a different way, a way that honors and dignifies one another, doesn't play games, doesn't put pressure, and invites. We're all going to buy Christmas presents. Let's give a Christmas present to some people that we may never even meet. Just yesterday, I got a text. I restrained myself, Kayla. I'm sending it to you and saying, hey, let's throw this on the screen because Kayla does such a good job of preparing this and kind of tag teaming with me. She's like my offensive lineman, you know, the left tackle that no one knows gets paid the big bucks. That's Kayla. She's like the left tackle minus the big bucks. Big bucks in heaven, Kayla. Small bucks on earth. (laughs) Um, Pastor Yesupadam in India, our partner, sent me did you get it, Daniel, to an email yesterday, last night, saying, hey, we got the beds. You remember the beds? This time last year, I was telling you, with next year's Legacy Fund, which was this year that we just are finishing, we're going to send a bunch, we're going to send money to this orphanage that we partner with in India. 
where this pastor who was pastoring a little church started the orphanage because literally babies were being left in garbage cans and brought to his church. And he's like, what do I do with this baby? So he took him into his house until his, his wife was like, no more babies, we can't handle them. So then he just started an orphanage. And they got so many kids that they're rescuing and redeeming their lives that they were sleeping two and three to a twin bed, right? And on the floor. And we heard that because our, minist- our missions leadership team came back and Kurt's like, hey, they got kids sleeping on the floor. And I was like, we got a legacy offering. We got a church that we're not all rich, but we have beds. And so everybody gave a bunch of money. He sent money to them and they bought the beds. So he sent a picture literally yesterday saying, here's the beds. No kids are sleeping on the floor. Tell Denver United, thank you. So thank you. All right, time for us to worship. You guys ready to worship, Jess? You guys ready to worship? Let's stand up and worship. As you do that, here's what I wanna ask you to do. Just stand up, you can stand up and then we're, I'm seriously done talking. Um, is just ask the Holy Spirit, hey, would you have me participate in this? Is there something I can do to kind of take a stand right now? You want me to be a part of this? And if so, Lord, you want to speak to me about that? You can scan the QR code. It'll take you online. You just check legacy in the fund instead of tithes and offerings. It'll go to the legacy fund. We'll have it open for the next couple weeks. So if you're like, man, I don't have the money now, but I can not go out to eat for a couple weeks. Cool. Or I need to pray about it. All right, great. No pressure. But let's just pray and seek God together. And then uh, we'll begin the season by giving, yeah? All right, let's worship. I forgot to tell you the end of the story. Esther doesn't die. She does go to the king, but I mean, all evidence to the conscience she's going to. And God took her willingness, teenager, not a diplomat, not a man in a patriarchal society, not a Persian in a racist society, She took her willingness. She went into the king and said, if I die, I die. And she said, this isn't right. And God turned his heart and saved his people. God is going to do the saving. God's going to fix the injustice. Lest we feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. And man, I have to, if I start into this thing, it's just overwhelming. And I'm going to get crushed by it. Just do your bit. Just be faithful. That's why I say, ask the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. He'll say, this is the way I want you to go. And walk in it. Just be faithful. Man, you all are so faithful. Here you are, serving Jesus in a city that believes that Jesus is a fairy tale. Standing for Jesus. Being light into so much darkness. God bless you. God bless you all. Man, I love you. Um, Legacy offering is open. Here's my two cents. Um, If you're not sure if you can, don't. Don't like, don't like make your, your bank overdraft when you go to buy the stuffing. Um, but if you can, know you can, and you're like, I really need to think about this. The longer we think about stuff, the easier it is to be out of sight, out of mind, or hem haw. Don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today, right? And if you're going to need to think about it or pray about it, totally respect that. Here's how I do that. Just put a mark on my calendar, a little thing that pops up with a reminder. Think about this. <laughs> Right? So I'm going to think about it between now and then. If I haven't thought about it and I think about it, then I'm going to make a decision at that point. And if you decide now, I'm not going to be a part of the legacy offering, totally fine. Um, let's, just, let's just prioritize first at the beginning of the holiday season, uh, honoring Jesus and being a part of the light in the midst of all this darkness that we're tangentially associated with. Yeah? Man, love you all. Okay, Deck the Halls is now. Um, I, um, you know how we think that we've kind of anthropomorphized Jesus and making him a white American male and he's probably really African or Middle Eastern? Well, I think that's true about Santa Claus too. I think he's actually a ginger. Come on, Santa. Ruddy and handsome. That's what God says about redheaded men. Follow that ginger in a Santa suit. Go out there and make merry. Have an amazing Thanksgiving week. Love you all so much. God bless you. See you next Sunday.